Hey, hello, how are you? This is a show for everyone else. Instead of going after top 1% of the world, we dedicate this podcast to celebrate the lives of the unsung heroes and self-made artists. It wasn't about the, necessarily the tricks. It wasn't about the sparkles. It wasn't about being spectacular. It was about connecting with the audience and creating a feeling of community within the circus ring and the audience and just that, that wonderful adventure that we all feel still when we go to the circus, but really connecting to the audience. I don't believe in the word success. For me, success is getting up and being able to work. It has nothing to do with being known or making money. I want people who are ready to try anything, to look foolish, to look ugly. I am not interested in the ego. No one in the seven figures is interested in the ego. In a way, every show, there's someone that you can directly relate to. And the reason that you can find that person, that one person or perhaps multiple people, is because they're sharing just small personal facts about themselves. And if I can get one person to connect to one person, that starts a chain effect throughout the whole show. My need was to look in the past to sort of find a map for how to deal with what's happening to us now in the world and how to move forward. Hi there, this is your host, Fei Wu from the Phase World Podcast. Welcome to our second episode in 2018. Time really flies, and the face world has been around for more than three years at this point, and we have launched over 130 episodes. Today, my new guest is Gypsy Snyder. Uh, Gypsy is one of the founders at The Seven Fingers, a contemporary circus collective, where she works as a writer and also a choreographer. Why are we so excited to interview her? Well, due to popular demand, since we have interviewed so many other circus artists, including, my gosh, the Atherton twins, and soon, uh, Gassia Atherton will be on the show as well. And previously, Ani Laplante, Irini Tornasaki, Roman Tomanov, and uh, there is a lot of interest in also learning about people behind the scenes, such as directors, Gypsy, uh, our guest today, has a very unique childhood. Both of her parents are not only circus actors, but actually had their own circus as a family business, where Gypsy performed since the age of five. So who are the seven fingers, you may be wondering, because most people still haven't heard of them or experienced uh, any show from the seven fingers. I first learned about them during my recording with Eric Langlois, who is the executive director at the National Circus School in Montreal. Cirque du Soleil is only one type of circus, I learned from Eric, and The Seven Fingers is yet another. Both have outstanding performances, but their philosophies and approaches are drastically different. This brings us to Gypsy, the creator for Reversible, an interactive experience inspired by the soaring spirit and simple spark of human nature. Reversible was touring in Boston during fall 2017 uh, in September. It was a 90-minute show hosted at the Emerson Cutler uh, Majestic Theater, one of my favorite show locations in Boston. It's small, intimate, yet very comfortable. So to me, Reversible is about finding that deep connection within ourselves that enables a deeper connection with others. Recently on an episode of Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee, Jerry Seinfeld picked up Patton Oswalt to get coffee at a local shop. 
Patton immediately started to break down all the stereotypes of the customers and workers there. And one of them he jokingly described as, you have to be white, you have to be very comfortable with diversity, but secretly you're terrified by the other races. It made me laugh so hard because there's a human connection barrier and some people don't know how to overcome it, even if they want to. I think that's the magic and essence of The Seven Fingers. Through its storytelling and choreography, it breaks down those barriers and exposes the most raw, uncut versions of our human existence. Gypsy is the woman leading the charge. On the show today, we talked about the creation process of the show, where and how she selected the group of male and female artists. Many of them were newly graduates from the National Circus School so you see, it comes full circle for us at Face World for having interviewed Eric um, as well as um, Gypsy at this point. I hope you enjoy this episode and maybe give it a chance to enjoy a show from The Seven Fingers because I don't think any YouTube videos uh, or promos would do the justice. If you enjoy this episode, please consider leaving us a comment. I read all of them and I love responding to them as well. Without further ado, please welcome Gypsy Snyder to the Face World podcast. So Gypsy, I'm so glad to have you on the show. And um, as you may know, I've interviewed uh, a lot of circus performers. And about a month ago, two months ago, I sat down and realize I really want to speak with someone like yourself, you know, who is the creator, the director, and your title goes on uh, very long, but, you know, you're so involved in the show and you created the yeah. show. So I had the pleasure to personally experience Re Reversible in Boston not so long oh. ago. Absolutely loved it. It was, oh, yeah. you know, especially towards the end, we all teared up. It wasn't just me. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, without giving away. I mean, there's nothing to really give away. But Gypsy, I would love to learn something about you and mm -hmm. um, your upbringing because I started reading more about you online. I did not realize that you are part of a circus family. Yeah, I am. I was born and raised in the circus. Uh, my parents were comedic jugglers and born in San Francisco. And they sort of started. I think the first really alternative circus in the United States in 1974 when I was four years old. And I think it's really important to say, you know, what we meant or what my parents meant by alternative circus at the time, it, it wasn't about the necessarily the tricks. It wasn't about the sparkles. We didn't have animals. It wasn't about being spectacular. It was about connecting with the audience and creating a feeling of community within the circus ring and the audience and just that that wonderful adventure that we all feel still when we go to the circus, but really connecting to the audience. So I was raised in that atmosphere and learned a lot from my parents about the importance of circus as a as an art form, not just as a technical thing, but as something that really has incredible power and impact to express ideas and emotions and to connect our humanity. Uh, those were all priorities for my parents, and that's how I grew up. I also I performed as a kid. My parents put me in the show every year, doing everything from acrobatics to tumbling to juggling to clowning, and. You'll notice in Reversible, I have the four women in the show. Each one has to do at least one comic moment. It's really important for me to have comedic elements in the show because I was raised that way, but also because my father really encouraged me to be a clown in many ways and to not just think of women as the beautiful woman on the trapeze or the beautiful girl with the, with the hula hoops, that, that women really had strength and power on stage. And, um, and that's something that I really, I think all, everyone at the seven fingers, we try and achieve that real personal comedic and theatrical value in women and in men on stage. Mm, I have so many questions for how you pick okay. that particular <laughs> cast. Cause everybody was 
Excellent. And we all know eight people, I, roughly eight people, I believe, 50% yeah. men, 50% yeah. women. They're so cohesive and they work so well together. I can imagine them grabbing a drink and they're you know, real friends in life. And you don't always see that because, you know, in circus and many or corporate America or kind of a competitive environment, there's always competition, whether it's said or not. Uh, competition is is really something. It's an incredible subject, and it and I think more and more we're trying to deal with the stress around compet- being competitive, but also because there's so much more pressure to use this this evil word that I don't like to use, which is to succeed. I don't believe in the word success. Uh, for me, success is getting up and being able to work. It, it has nothing to do with being known or making money. I believe that being successful is achieving some kind of forward movement and health and and being able to do the things that I love in my life or with my family. Those are things if, for that. That's what success means to me. Mm-hmm. So I think one of the beauties in circus and at least in the in the circus community that I know, the global community that I know, especially growing up in this business Competition is not really inherent in circus. I sent both my kids to gymnastics just because there was a, a studio near my school. And I thought, oh, that'd be a good preparatory program for them in case they do want to do circus at some point and a good training for them. And both of them enjoyed it. But at some point, there were two issues. One was they reacted very negatively to the competition. They, they didn't want to be better than the other kids around them. And they didn't like feeling that other kids around them were better than they were. And I realized that's just something that you don't really find in circus because in circus, everyone is individual. So I might be working with, uh, let's say I'm, I'm a trapeze artist and I might know another trapeze artist who is really, really good. And I might go, oh my God, she's really good. But what can I do? personally to achieve my excellence on stage doesn't have to do with being better than her because mm-hmm. it's it's really circus is so much more about your individuality than having a common denominator that everyone is supposed to achieve whereas in gymnastics everyone has to learn this move mm-hmm. and if you if everyone executes it perfectly then they go to the next level mm-hmm. that that doesn't exist in circus. It, it exists in gymnastics. It even, to a certain extent, exists in dance. Not all dance, but, uh, you know, ballet has its ideals. Black Swan as in a exactly, movie. Exactly, exactly. It's really intense. And, and I, I, you know, I think that even ballet is starting to re-identify itself with the Misty Copelands of the world. Um, who are saying, look, ballet can have individuality. Ballet can have perfection in in a new defined space. And and circus has always had that. So right away, um, the fact that you feel the the cohesiveness of the group in Reversible, that that thing that you mentioned, that that they really seem to be friends and they really work together, that is is very much the circus community. However, I will also say that that feeling of, you know, just the melding together so perfectly, that is the, it's one of the staples of the seven fingers. So the first show that we created, the seven founders of the company were actually on stage. We were performing and it was, the story was seven friends who lived in a loft apartment together. And the show was called Loft. Now we really were friends and we really practically did live together at the time while we were founding the company. (laughs) So we really wanted to talk about something that was real for us, but we didn't play exactly ourselves on stage. We decided to take it to another sort of theatrical level, a, a slight abstraction of who we are and what our relationships were. And we really felt that the personality, that creating that cohesive energy on stage was really something that people weren't seeing around the world in circus at the time. Circus, since our first show 15 years ago, 16 years ago, has evolved. If connectivity is our main goal, connecting to the audience and connecting people's uh, empathy and emotions, that has to start with the cast. Mm -hmm. So when we create any show and we're casting it, first of all, I need to cast a show 
only with people who are ready to let their ego completely go. I am not interested in the ego. No one in the seven figures is interested in the ego, maybe in pride a little bit, but I want people who are ready to try anything, to look foolish, to look ugly, to not you know, I, I don't, we don't work with artists that come up and say, oh, I don't really like that. I don't want to try that. It's, you really have to be able to stand on the precipice with me, with the seven fingers and say, let's create something together. And, and creating something together means it's not about me. It's not about the seven fingers and it's not about the individual artist. It's about the thing that we're creating together, together. So that energy that you feel is something that we cultivate from the casting to the very first rehearsal. I insist that they trust each other, that they work together. I push them. I push them physically very, very hard. Uh, Theatrically, the, the kind of improvisation and workshops that we do together are incredibly intense. So in my professional career, 10 plus years, we have to conduct interviews all the time. You know, when you think about whether it's for full time or for a show, but sometimes you don't always end up with the people you thought you knew what we, what you were signing up for. So I thought that was really intricate of an assembly almost. So how, what were you looking for? Because you don't get to experience who they're really like during the interview with suits on, right? No, really not. So let's see. First of all, I knew I wanted four men, four women, uh, and that was actually not necessarily because I wanted gender equality, although that was also a plus, but because of the walls having two sides, I really wanted to find a balance. And so I really wanted a person per side, so to speak. Then there were two performers that had been in our, in our company for quite some time, Julien and Emily, both French. He was in Psy, then he was in Amuse, then he was in Traces, then he was in Queen of the Night, uh, m- many of our productions. And he introduced us to Mimi, who was his girlfriend at the time. And I worked with her. We sort of collaborated and did a couple of workshops with her. So I already knew her energy. I hired her for a muse. Then Shana, one of the seven fingers, she hired her for queen of the night. And when they finished queen of the night, they came to Shana and I and said that they really, really wanted to stay with the company and wanted to go back on a touring show because queen of the night was permanent in New York city. So, and we like working with people that we've already worked with because they, they've learned sort of our vocabulary, our way of working. I know them. I can go further. Um, I can push them harder. And both of them are very multi-talented. After that, um, Emmy Vauté, who is the Swiss Japanese girl, uh, I hired her for a muse. You know, she's so young, so talented, and one of the most positive hardworking people I had ever worked with. So after that experience on that show, I knew absolutely I wanted to work with her again. So I approached her. And then Natasha, she was my student when she was five years old in San Francisco. And I knew absolutely that I wanted her because she's just so unique. I approached her and she said, well, you know, there's a couple of people in my class because in her graduating class that I'd like you to meet. And I invited her and the four other performers from Reversible. And we sat on the floor in my living room and I asked them where they came from, what their goals were, why they did circus. Uh, what their relationship was to their actual main discipline. So not just circus as a whole, but what what is the attachment to hand balancing or Korean plank or juggling. And then mostly I really ask questions about what, why do they perform? What is, what is art to them? What is circus? What is their responsibility mm-hmm. as performers? And how do they want to achieve uh, fulfilling that responsibility. And I'd pretty much say I hired them right after speaking with them. I fell really in love with them, just talking to them. Um, knowing I wanted to hire them, 
was before I even saw them perform ever. That That's kind of instinctive. Yeah. Really is something I can really resonate with, I think, with a lot of people. Um, when you interview someone, the moment they, they carry themselves, they walk through the door, how they shake your hands, how they really look you in the eyes, that connection is something that I had watching all these performers. And and it's really easy for the audience to compare who their favorite is or, you know, how they compare against each other. But there was no comparison going on because you picked people. You know, they're so cohesive. They're so ad- They're more than adequate. They're astonishing when it comes to honing in their skills. And mm-hmm. I, I, I really pushed them to fall in love with the audience. And what I'm hoping with all of our shows, it's not that you're picking you know, a which one is better than the other, but in a way, every show, there's someone that you can directly relate to. Mm-hmm. And the reason that you can find that person, that one person, or perhaps multiple people is because they're sharing just small personal facts about themselves or a look or a sense of humor that is something that resonates with you as an individual in the audience. And if I can get one person to connect to one person, that starts a chain effect throughout the whole show um, and throughout the whole experience. So for people who are listening who have not seen the show, highly recommended. And it's a traveling show. It was in Boston only for a short period of time. Otherwise, I would have seen it more than once. Um, like a movie you really appreciate that you want to watch multiple times because you know each time you get something out of that. You see something different. There are a lot of people running around. You feel like you may have missed out some of the stories. But I think the what's really unique about the production and the storyline is that they're all real. They're real people. They're real stories that these kids researched. Um, but I believe is about their grandmothers. You know, it's just incredible. But I gotta ask. You know, how, I'm a huge fan of Cirque du Soleil, but I learned so much about Seven Fingers. And I interviewed Eric Longlois. He was amazing, and he mentioned Seven Fingers so many times and I because in because Cirque du Soleil has this crazy world recognized brand in Asia everywhere I realized that sometimes we just don't know we haven't experienced other things right doesn't mean that they're not interesting or not as good but open me up to all a whole new set of possibilities and you know and the reversible is such a, a in my mind is just a perfect example of what seven fingers is capable of doing but i must ask you as a creator of someone instead of writing up a story that's all about you and yourself and that's really easy to do and that's what most people will do um putting on masks and have these eight kids just to be maybe play your relatives or people in your life but it's actually about their life. What was that thinking or thought process like to make it not about yourself? <laughs> well, actually, that's really that's a, an incredible question, and I, I've never had it put to me before in that way. And it's very true that most directors will really project their idea or their image or their you know their concept onto the stage, and then have everyone play parts in it. And we have a couple of productions where it's more like that, where we're actually putting on, in a way, a play where you're asked to play someone else. That We do that sometimes. But our touring shows, one of the goals of that is that it feels like the show is coming out of the performers. That's that connectivity that we're looking for. But the reality is I got the idea for Reversible from my own experience. And... I really, very recently, I'd say in the last two, I guess I started writing the show two years ago. And that's something that's really important to understand is that the show is actually written by me. My need was to look in the past to sort of find a map for how to deal with what's happening to us now in the world and how to move forward. And more and more, I am looking toward my heritage, who, where I come from, how my parents got to where they are, 
which I never did before. I'm 47 years old. And for the first time I'm actually going, Hey mom, how did this happen? You know, and I don't, I don't have my grandparents anymore to ask these questions to. And when I did have them, I never asked them about, it it was almost disrespectful to ask them how they were when they were my age. So I'm one of those fortunate people who has a family that still has a house that's been in the, that house has been in the the family for many generations. And that house happens to be in Massachusetts. I was there and I was, it was the end of sort of the fall season and we close up the house in the winter. And so I had to wash the sheets and everyone from the family had left and my kids were horseback riding. So I was all alone at this house in the countryside with no, you know, we don't have neighbors. It's a huge, in the, countryside there. I was was purely alone. And I was hanging the sheets on the clothesline. All of a sudden I felt, you know, there's no one around me for like at least 300 acres. I felt really afraid. I was really scared. I kept looking over my shoulder, like there was going to be a bear or like something terrible was going to happen. I realized it had been so long since I had been alone, completely alone, you know, no cell phone, nothing, completely alone. And it was so quiet that I thought for a moment, oh my God, I'm going to die here alone and no one's even going to see it. No one's even going to know what happened. And as I, as I continue, I just kept putting the clothes on the line. And all of a sudden I realized like even the sheets in my hand had been in my family for so many generations and all the women who had put the clothes on the line for so many years. And all of a sudden I wasn't scared anymore. Just feeling that heritage of this action and this place and that, and that only, you know, only 50 years ago, everyone hung their clothes on the line. Now we don't do that. We put it in a washing machine or God forbid, we just buy whole new outfits every month at H&M for super cheap. So that feeling, that moment was when I started writing the show. And I started to think of all these questions that I would want to ask my grandparents. And I wrote them out and I sent them to the cast and I gave them homework. Uh, And what was interesting was we started workshops in February. So this was in November. I wrote them and I said, okay, it's almost Christmas time. Most of you are going to either see your families or you're going to call your families before we start this production. So here's the homework. You need to ask a grandparent or a great grandparent if they're still alive a number of things that were happening to them when they were your age. And they needed to say something that happened to them at when they were their age that changed the course of their lives or talk about something that happened in the world that changed the course of their lives. So uh, their experience in World War I or World War II or a marriage, or a divorce, or a death in the family, or an illness, you know, at what, whatever it was. They, they all came back with different stories. We did our first workshop. Then I gave them a whole new set of questions. Or I asked them to ask a different parent something about that same thing, so that we really could understand every angle of the stories that they were telling. And then over time, I would say over four, five, six months, I started to put together what they were actually going to say. And some of the words came from them directly, but sometimes I had to really refine the text to work on stage. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Since we didn't get to really experience perhaps your grandparents' stories as the cast was acting out more of their own storylines, what did you learn or find surprising as part of your heritage that you like to share with the, the listeners? Well, actually, oddly enough, I didn't really find anything that was so surprising that I didn't quite know before, but my family was very, it's very much sort of about respect. So I started looking through photo albums and I started asking questions and I would say, oh, so who is this woman? And where did it, very interestingly enough, my mother, my aunt, and my uncle would always start by saying, oh, I don't know. We don't know. We don't know. (laughs) And so then I would start looking through and sort of going, oh, okay, I found a name. I found another picture and here's her name. So then I would put the name there and I'd say, and they'd say, oh, I don't think that's actually who it is. And I was like, no, they really look alike. No, I don't think so. And then about a week later, as they started to look through the albums and they started to open up, they started to get interested and they were started to have, 
be a little bit excited that I was interested. But it took me so long to get them to want to talk about their pasts. And I realized that something we do, you know, with a younger generation is that we, we push ourselves away. We want them, we want the younger generation to move forward. And I think that that's a huge danger. I think that there is so many lessons and keys in the past that starting maybe in the fifties or sixties, it was more cool to rebel against the generation before you, maybe because the generation before you went to war, or maybe because they were lost in the Holocaust, or maybe because the Vietnam War didn't make any sense. Those are things we don't want to talk about. But now I'm finding that it's time for us to start digging again. And even if the elders don't want to talk, it's important that we do talk. And so I guess the thing that I found the most, I mean, there wasn't any huge surprises, but I think the thing that was most touching to me was that I was opening conversations with the generation above me that I never dared to before. And it was uncomfortable, but if I just kept digging respectfully, I could get there. learn so much from history. And, you know, I, I grew up in Beijing, China, and I didn't particularly enjoy history because there was so much of it. I love there's many aspects of what you have created, I thought, from an educational perspective, was very innovative because the way that we have always structured history lessons about remembering the year and the name. But if you take those stats and kind of context, a, a, sort of the stats away from the context actually is not that interesting. And plus it's not that important to be honest. No. It's the, um, what emotional, what was, uh, how we were evolving emotionally and intellectually. That's where the key is. And if you really try and put yourself into, and this was what was so incredible about my cast was you know, they would tell me the stories and I could tell they're like, yeah, yeah, she was in a prearranged marriage and she left Japan. And I would say like, can you imagine how incredible that must have been for her? How scary that must have been for her? So we would really talk it out. So for me, it was really important to put these young, daring, wonderful performers into a, into a, a realm of a life that might not have been so simple. Uh, it's really, really about taking the subject matter and digging and making it real for us. So that's the other thing. It's like, it's one thing to look back in history, but to really put yourself in an empathetic position, you need to have someone stand in front of you with emotion and say, I, I did this. I looked back at my grandmother's life and without her action, I would not have the courage that I have now. Mm-hmm. And that reminds me of Brene Brown on the power of vulnerability. Yeah. And it's interesting when I look at two very successful, well, using that word of successful and, and um, define to me that looking at Seven Fingers versus Cirque du Soleil, other than the fact that the students may have some overlapping skills, the way that you approach the circus world is so polar opposite. And I love that because it's so easy to copy, you know, in today's world. I want to be Tim Ferriss. I want to be Seth Godin. You know, uh, Elon Musk is another perfect example that everybody wants to become. But to me, Seven Fingers open up a route of not only a way, a different way to be successful, but a completely different way of making me feel. And, you know, people always say, use the metaphor, it's not about you know, what he did, but how he made you feel. And that's really powerful. And that's also kind of mysterious too, because there are, uh, what I learned from the show Reversible is that so many things that seems trivial, like in words and you plain English, and then there are people who are not even native speakers. Many of them are not, you know, but their experience, even if they weren't speaking, I could relate to them because you see the story. Well, I would say it's, it's really, I mean, I, 
the thing that happens to me when I go to Cirque du Soleil now, or I could, you know, I'm trying to think of another example, but when you go see something that's big and spectacular, it can be inspiring, but again, it doesn't necessarily motivate my own humanity. And I think with our company, what we've been really, really, really trying to do is say, each one of us as individuals, no matter how talented and hardworking we are, it's really the courage of telling your story or creating your work or moving forward your way with passion and determination. It is only in that that you will achieve your own success. And, and I can use success in this sentence because it doesn't mean a success of money or financial. It means sort of succeeding as your person because you deeply believe in, in yourself. I love that statement because there's so much more we can do together. Um, you know, I, there is truly a lot of the time I spend alone, projects I work on alone. There's some benefits because you don't have a stakeholder to approve certain yeah, things. Yeah. A coworker was just asking me today that how come there are environments where people feel loved, supported, they can be themselves, they can be naked. And, you know, what, what you described is so sincere. What I find also for the act that for me to reach out to you also because, you know, the title of the show is uh, it's Face World, but it's really about the unsung heroes and self-made artists. Yeah. And in my mind, if I were to survey people outside, I guarantee you 99% of the people would say, when they're going to go to Cirque du Soleil, as if there's no other way to succeed or to have a fulfilling, you know, sort of circus career. And that is incorrect. That is simply <laughs> not true. And you are shiny. You are a great example as one of the founders for something that I I hear about. But also simultaneously, I had family members who were traveling in Montreal who saw a different show from Seven Fingers and they couldn't stop talking about it. You know, they really couldn't. Let's just say there are other shows that people may have seen that they they were very they were very impressed at the time, but they stopped talking about it. You know, but Seven Fingers have stayed with them. I think I think Seven Fingers does have an incredible power or maybe I was going to say an impact on people. The most important thing I would have to say about the work that we do is that because we're always trying to create something that's intimate and that is and something that is disarming that like like take off your your armor and have this experience with us now. On the one hand, that means maybe we're not a big corporate entity that everybody is like running to go see and spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars to go see. But at the same time, the people who do see us are incredibly moved and come back again and again. So I have to say that the kind of success that we have is the kind of success that we want and, and that we will continue to, to strive for. I'm, I'm not really interested in doing a show for any other reason. It does happen that we do larger productions. Um, it is, it happens that we collaborate with Cirque du Soleil even. That's not a problem. I love going to Cirque du Soleil. I go whenever they perform in town, we go. I love going to the tent. I love the big spectacle. It, it really brings out a child in me. So it's really not one or the other, but I do want to celebrate the fact that both can exist. And I love how you did you are successful if you actually ask yourself, what does success mean to me? You know, we, we learn so young to have a certain set of rules and guidance. But, you know, I live in Boston. Um, you know, my mom is friends with nobody in my family is in finance, but we we are friends with a few hedge fund managers who can afford 40 million dollar apartment <laughs> to purchase, yeah. you know, on top of four seasons. Mm -hmm. And when they hear that I run a podcast, they're always so intrigued. Oh, what yeah. is that? How do you make money from it? It's really hard to explain that. Yes, I do make money on the side. I don't make money from the podcast, but because of the podcast, I get to know so many people. I work on each project I'm so insanely passionate about, including the one I'm going to Vegas for shortly. Uh, I'm, I want to close on with a few questions. Yeah. First of all, I'm dying to know, how old were you when you were a little girl acting mm -hmm. as a clown? And could mm -hmm. you bring yourself back to that moment in your childhood and let me know how you felt? I'm trying to remember the first times that my parents put me on stage. I mean, what was interesting was that I was 
I was able to see my parents on stage. And then there was that moment of like me being pulled onto the stage to be with them. And I remember fear. And then I remember like pure joy and elation. There's so much adrenaline that happens when you realize people are watching you and you make a gesture and they react to it. It's very addictive, even as a child. You know, you have the love of your parents, but then all of a sudden you have like the admiration of total strangers. I would say, first of all, it it was empowering. Second of all, it created a relationship with my parents that is undescribable, a connection and a vulnerability and a, and a form of communication that is professional, not just familiar, not just a family connection, that I feel so honored to have had that kind of relationship with my parents. And, and while at times it was hard to have to be professional while being a kid, at the same time, learning those responsibilities and having that respect from my parents was also huge. What was it like? Uh, these sounds like rapid fire questions. Um, what was it like to have both parents as circus performers? I I often wonder about that. Knowing Atherton Garcia, you know, and their two kids, yeah, like, yeah. are they like, you know, juggling apples and pears and and th- throwing knives? And I don't know. <laughs> I get that. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's when you see your parents do it. I mean, one, the love that you have for your parents is one thing, but then you see them doing such incredible things you have pretty high standards and it's, it's hard to, it's hard to meet that. Uh, it can be a little bit of a pressure. Um, I don't feel that with the Atherton's. I feel like their kids are just loving it and going for it. So I think they really create a lot of joy around that. It really depends. I mean, circus is something that is, is a, is always passed down through generations. I mean, and it's unlike other art forms, which can be multi-generational circus. That's what it was. I mean, you didn't learn at a school uh, uh, 50 years ago. There were no schools necessarily other than uh, perhaps in mainland China, or um, there were certain places in Russia and eventually it's in France and Europe, but mostly circus was what you learned from your parents. And they made your costumes and they trained you. And so in a way, it's very natural. I mean, I think it's very, it's, it's a natural thing and it's, and it's really fun. I mean, how many people grow up and their parents go to work and they don't even know what their parents do. So, so this is, it's obviously a very beautiful way to be able to connect to your parents. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. I mean, I love how it all comes around and that's why I love the show. And I always remember that. And I mm-hmm. hopefully when I travel to a different city, if it's playing there, I would love to see that again. For sure. For sure. Thank thanks you. so much, Gypsy. It was so, thank such you. a pleasure. Pleasure to meet you. Take care. Likewise. Thank you. Bye. Hope you enjoy this episode of the Phase World podcast. My team and I will be thrilled if you choose to write us a review on iTunes. It really helps to get the word out. Simply search for Phase World Podcast in your iTunes app under Podcast. Click on Readings and Reviews tab and then write a review. The star review takes seconds or a brief text review will be fantastic too. Thank you on behalf of me and my team from Phase World.